just because atoms in a covalent bond are sharing electrons doesn't mean they're doing so equally. And in fact, many covalent bonds, most, many would argue, consist of an asymmetric distribution of electrons. Electrons are spending more time or exist in higher density near one of the nuclei than the other. This is called a polar covalent bond when the two atoms involved have relatively different electronegativity, so different extents of attracting electrons to themselves. And the hydrogen chlorine bond, HCl, is a classic example of this. This is an example of a polar covalent bond and that's associated with what we call a dipole a separation of charge because the electrons are spending more time near the more electronegative chlorine and less time near the less electronegative hydrogen atom or more correctly the electron density is higher near the chlorine than it is near the hydrogen this leads to a dipole positive charge near the hydrogen negative charge near the chlorine and the root of it is the greater electron density near the chlorine atom so this dipole vector in black represents where the partial positive charge is located, where you see that cross at the start of the arrow, or the head of uh, the tail of the arrow, rather, and where the negative charge is located, where you see the head of the arrow. We also represent the same situation using the symbols delta plus and delta minus. Delta plus represents partial positive charge. Delta minus represents partial negative charge. And you can see how these symbols match up with the implied locations of that charge via the dipole vector and actually the electron density, which implies greater negative charge where the electron density is greater because electrons are negatively charged. We're going to return to polar covalent bonds when we talk about molecular polarity at the very end of this unit. And it's going to be important to recognize polar covalent bonds by looking for atoms that differ quite a bit in electronegativity. Now, what is electronegativity? We may not have talked about this yet. Electronegativity is the tendency of an atom to attract electrons to itself. It's related, for example, to electron affinity. More exothermic electron affinity is associated with greater electronegativity. The atom attracts electrons to itself, tends to stabilize electrons as they approach the atom, so on and so forth. And this determines how electrons are shared in polar covalent bonds, or pure covalent bonds for that matter. Electronegativity is, I would argue, the most important periodic trend, and it's fully driven by effective nuclear charge, Z effective. So it follows the same trends, for example, as electron affinity. Electronegativity tends to increase as we move to the right on the periodic table as effective nuclear charge increases, and electronegativity decreases as we move down the periodic table as that effective nuclear charge diminishes as our valence shell gets farther and farther from the nucleus. This is a critical periodic trend and one that you'll need to be familiar with if you plan to take organic chemistry all the way through the end of organic chemistry and really in any chemistry course you, you will take, electronegativity is a foundational structural concept. What does electronegativity have to do with bond polarity? Well, the greater the electronegativity of an atom, the more strongly it attracts electrons to itself, and the greater the electron density around that atom in a bond with an atom that is less electronegative than the one in question. So if we're looking at a particular bond between two atoms, let's call them X and Y, the relative electronegativity of X and Y tells us where the electron density is. If Y is more electronegative than X, the electron density will tend to be concentrated on Y, for example. So we can kind of break things down into three possible situations. In the first case, the electronegativity difference between the bonded atoms is zero. Put another way, the atoms are identical. Two carbons, two bromines, two chlorines, something like this. This would be a situation like Cl, Cl. This is what we call a pure covalent bond. There are intermediate situations where there's a substantial electronegativity difference between the two atoms involved in the bond but the bond is still covalent. Electrons are still being shared. We haven't made an ionic bond, in other words. We haven't made ions outright by shifting the electrons all the way to chlorine, for example. But the electron density is still mostly on the more electronegative chlorine atom, and this is associated with a pretty large electronegativity difference. We'll come to that in a second. Finally, we have very large differences in electronegativity, and this happens when we're Thinking about a bond between an atom on the left-hand side of the periodic table, which tends to form cations, 
and on the right-hand side of the periodic table, which tends to form anions, in these situations, when those atoms get together, they'll form ions on their own spontaneously. A good example is sodium chloride, which is really not a covalent compound at all. It's Na plus and Cl minus. And the origin of this is the very large electronegativity difference between the metallic sodium and the non-metallic chlorine. At that point, we're in ionic bonding territory. Now, the, tr the thing that always gets a little confusing is where is the cutoff between pure covalent and polar covalent? Is any electronegativity difference at all sufficient to establish a polar covalent bond? If you want to be pedantic about it, yes. But generally speaking, electronegativity differences less than about 0.4 on the Pauling scale are still pretty much nonpolar bonds, or what we would call pure covalent bonds. Once you get above that cutoff of 0.4, somewhere between 0.4 and 1.8, again on the Pauling scale, you're dealing with a polar covalent bond, and HCl is a nice example of that. If you're talking about an electronegativity difference greater than 1.8, that's going to be getting into ionic bonding territory. All that said, this black arrow here, and the arrows here, and the arrow here, suggest that bonding is a continuum from pure covalent through polar covalent through ionic. There are bonds that almost defy categorization. Carbon mercury is a good example, where it's definitely got ionic character, but it also has a considerable amount of covalent character, and the electronegativity difference is somewhere in the middle of the scale. So this table is really more of a rough guideline than anything else, and I would say for your particular situation, refer to your instructor's guidelines and how they think about this. This comes out of the OpenStax Chemistry 2nd Edition textbook, and it's the one I tend to use in intro chemistry situations. Let's work a quick practice problem now where we think about the relative polarities of the bonds listed here and try to arrange them from most to least polar or vice versa. So we've got a list of bonds here. I've gone ahead and created a table where I list the bonds. And in order to assess the relative polarities of the bonds, we need to know the difference in electronegativity or the delta En between the two atoms involved in the bonds. That's going to require knowing what the electronegativities are, so I've gone ahead and gone to the periodic table and gotten these electronegativity values from that. ptable.com, by the way, is a great one to look at if you want values for Pauling electronegativities like this. So pulled those off the periodic table, I've created my table, and now what we're going to do for each bond is determine delta En determine where that puts us in terms of the scale of pure covalent, polar covalent, or ionic, and say if we're all in polar covalent territory, we can assess the extent of polarity, the size of the dipole moment, the magnitude of that charge separation in the bond using delta En as a numerical guideline, as a rough measure of that charge separation, really. So for example, for the CH bond, the difference in electronegativity is 0 0.4, 2.5 minus 2.1, with carbon more electronegative than hydrogen. So carbon is partially negative, hydrogen partially positive. For the CN bond, nitrogen is more electronegative than carbon to the tune of 0 0.5 electronegativity uh, units, 3.0 minus 2.5. For the carbon-oxygen bond, oxygen is again more electronegative than carbon, and the difference in electronegativity is even larger now, 1.0. For the NH bond, nitrogen is more electronegative than hydrogen, so negative charge on the more electronegative nitrogen atom, positive charge on the hydrogen, and the electronegativity difference is now 0.9. For OH, we are at a situation where the oxygen is more electronegative than the hydrogen, and the electronegativity difference here is 1.4, quite polar there. And then for the SH bond, we're looking at an electronegativity difference of 0.4, with the sulfur slightly more electronegative than the hydrogen. So now that we have those differences in electronegativity down, we can see that most of these bonds are essentially polar covalent bonds. The SH and CH bonds are in nonpolar covalent territory, or pure covalent, as we've called it so far. And we can just rank these based on delta En. So the least polar bond is the CH bond, followed quickly by the SH bond. The CN bond comes next followed by the NH bond, followed by the CO bond, and the most polar bond is the OH bond. So the greatest electronegativity difference is associated with the most polar bond, and the 
least polar bond is associated with the smallest electronegativity difference.